New Century, a landmark in video entertainment. Detailing global history in the time after the plagues. From 1872 onward, our world experienced a series of changes that radically altered the role mankind played as the dominant species. Now we will look back on the past 150 eventful years and examine where and when those changes occurred. The tragedy of war, the complexity of conflicting ideals, the despair that gripped us when a fearsome new affliction threatened our very existence, the isolation felt on a divided planet without the ability to communicate, the terror of encountering dangerous new species, and the breakthroughs that occurred when we rose to these challenges. Season 1 focuses on the Cartographer's Handbook, written and compiled by Thomas W. Arlington in 1882 while appointed Director of the Reunified States National Intelligence Agency. This infamous document was instrumental in shaping the lives of the American people of the day. The controversy and conflict of the events that followed its second publication, as presented here, will of course be the subject of future seasons, along with the broader global ramifications. Producer and editor Alexander Shaw, in collaboration with Arlington's descendant, Philippa Joanne Arlington, have labored for over five years of painstaking research. They bring this to you now in a manner that Thomas may well have chosen had the technology and communications been available to him. You will hear accounts in the words of the men, the women, and others of the age recovered from archived materials and conveyed to you by a full cast. Where possible, original photographic materials have been utilized alongside contemporary media to accentuate tone, emotional resonance, and historical relevance. This is the first time that Arlington's legacy has been revisited in this manner. Now, step back with us into the new century. The Cartographer's Handbook, 1883 edition, by Thomas W. Arlington. I will begin by extending my greetings to all peoples who are reading or hearing these words. It is my blessed privilege to have been granted the lines of communication necessary to bring them to you. What follows may change your perception of the state of our world. I apologize for its more frightening implications but give it your full attention so that the actions of others might stimulate your own and lead to the full commitment, body and soul, which your country requires of you. For decades this nation has been gripped by fear and doubt, first with a war of brother against brother that nearly cut our homeland in two, a span of the hardest of years which left families rent asunder and townships in ashes, but it was in the reunification years afterwards, when we were at our most fragile, that the blight came upon us, dividing and scattering, severing all bonds and propelling us out into the wilderness in a bid to escape the worst of it. That was the period that has truly tested America's resolve. To the American people who have not yet heard news of this, or whose understanding of the facts has been based upon a litany of rumor and speculation, the United States that existed up to a few years ago have gone through a period of social and political upheaval. It reached a point where the lines of civilized society became so strained and broken that we could no longer in all good conscience and honesty call ourselves united. Beginning in Mississippi, the eastern states fell one by one and a period of years when this land became an ungoverned and deadly wilderness gripped the nation, as it did almost certainly across the entirety of the globe. In that time our governments, our cities, our lines of communication, our systems of law and order, even our national identity, fell almost beyond retrieval. No military appointment, no uniform, nor allegiance, dictated the terms of engagement. This army cared not for politics, 
They concede no mercy and fear no reprisal. Husband, wife and child alike have been the casualties of this war, along with livestock, peaceful sleep, and the very idea of home. But while despair creeps in and makes himself our seemingly inescapable neighbor, despite all you may have feared, all you may have heard, all evidence to the contrary, I can assure you this, it is not the end of us. Due to relatively swift action and the bravery and skill of thousands of newly assigned members of the American military, Washington, the District of Columbia, was retaken in 1880. It is from here, where I write this, that we will draw back all the territories to our governance and protection, purging from our houses, forests, highways and cities, the scourge that has laid undue claim to our God-given land. President Ulysses S. Grant, in his eleventh year in office, a position secured by electoral vote in 1877, then decreed that our nation be rechristened the Reunified States as a measure to bolster the hearts of the disenfranchised and as a statement of our intent. With your help and that of every other citizen, we shall fight and prevail to once more taste the sweet breath of freedom that is our right. Bear this in your mind with every word of the following that you hear. The creatures who stalk this land are not the greatest threat to our fractured civilization. Lack of ability, lack of readiness, lack of cooperation, and above all things a lack of knowledge to overcome. These are the real enemy. By means of this book, I, Thomas W. Arlington, director of the newly emplaced National Intelligence Agency, hope to imbue you and every other listener with that most precious of resources, knowledge. This will be the crucible of our gathered intelligence, forsaking apocryphal rumor and superstition. We will, instead, deal only with indisputable facts. To the soldiers, both old and new, I proffer my humblest gratitude and comradeship. I myself am a veteran of the Civil War and fought at the Second Battle of Corinth, and at Fort Henry. I even survived Shiloh, though I scarcely know how. I can only say that the retaking of Washington in 1880 was, while equally bloody, a victory for all men who fought there. This is a different kind of war, one where brothers and, indeed, sisters may stand together. I can fully comprehend the magnitude of horror that you face and I would ask you to listen well to the accounts in this book. They will lend you strength and resolve in battle. And of those two precious commodities, our country needs every ounce. And to the scouts, my agents in the field, the ones reading this aloud to every group you meet, you are the key to spreading this information. It must be brokered with judiciousness and respect. Truth and clarity are the open hands we extend to a wounded nation, offering our aid, and in taking theirs we pull them back to their feet to join us on the fields of war. Write in your journal every day, record your findings, and convey them to our information networks, the better to weave a grand and ever-changing tapestry of American life in these desperate hours, and to give us the essential understanding and overview we must have if we are to see victory. You will craft our new maps and chart these territories. This is what it truly means to be a cartographer. Let us now sweep aside the curtain to better familiarize ourselves with what we face. Let us now fight back. It may take everything we have to give, and more, but if we do not rise to this supreme challenge, then make no mistake, everything will be taken from us nonetheless.
Part 1. Our Enemy. The Creatures. It is right that we begin this doctrine of survival by examining the creatures that were once men and against whom we must survive as a species. To face this foe, they must first have a name. Too many different and conflicting terms have been applied in the years since they were first encountered. With those names came supposition, superstition, and a lack of understanding. Ghoul, Wraith, Vampire, Goblin. None of these are wholly accurate, based as they are on stories that have existed in our mythology since the first tribes sat round the first fires. They are, however, all theories with a rooted basis in recorded maladies of the body and mind. I would not take it upon myself to conceive of a new word to apply to these creatures, though circumstance and rationality do in fact call for it. Instead, I will, for purposes of practicality and uniformity, afford them their Algonquin name, a word divulged to me by Cree Indians. It is a word from their culture and history, a label given to man at his most savage, mindless, and self-indulgent. Wendigo A Wendigo is the word the Indians give to one who commits the sin of cannibalism, the ingestion of human flesh, and worse, the slaughter of the owner of said flesh. It is a parable they tell themselves to ward off this abominable crime in the depths of winter or the grip of famine. Eat of another man, and you shall be cursed with unending hunger. For the duration of this book I shall use the term Wendigo in discussing these creatures. I use this label in the understanding that the legend behind it be seen for precisely what it is, a cautionary tale for times of hardship. The word itself is not a scientific explanation of the ones we now face, though I will attempt at all times to maintain that rationality. It is manifestly a symbol. You must bear this symbolism with wisdom of its meaning. These creatures are not of a mind. They have no humanity within them. They devour human flesh and live as wild beasts. They are, at their core, the darkest reflection of our base selves. It is with the human intellect they lack that we will defeat them. The body and brain of the Wendigo is something you must understand in order to triumph. Our advantage is that they do not understand us. They do not know our minds, nor would they comprehend. First and foremost, we must forget the people they were. That was another life. They are with God now. Their bodies are being inhabited, some would say by evil spirits. I believe it is a disease of the flesh that we do not yet understand but we have seen enough good people torn asunder in attempting to reason with them to know that nothing but the twisted body of their former self remains. This is not a passing sickness, nor fever that can be recovered from with the Lord's mercy or passage of time. They are another being entirely now. You must put from your minds the memory of your loved ones that have been claimed. I say again, they are with God now and it is only right that we see to it that their remains are dealt with in appropriate fashion. The Wendigo is best described as a man who behaves in the manner of a savage animal. They are often solitary hunters, akin to the puma, using their terrain to remain hidden and striking quickly. This attack often comes from an elevated position, trees and buildings proving excellent hiding places and observation points. They will watch a group of soldiers and choose the most opportune moment to strike, often not revealing themselves at all unless spotted and attacked. They are possessed of a peculiar animal cunning as well as agility most often associated with the great apes of Africa. Additional for 1883 Since the first publication of this guide seven months ago, New information has availed itself on this condition. It is conveyed to you now with the proviso that everything you have heard and will continue to hear is still applicable. 
everything now proven to be inaccurate has been deleted. In the minority of cases, a percentage so small and insubstantial that we cannot yet quantify it, recovery is in fact possible. However, this instance often carries with it more danger than the certainty of death. An incident in Jonestown, Ohio broke out when cartographer scouts sent in to greet a village organized a routine cleansing of the infected. A man intervened and claimed it was possible to withstand the effects of infection. When challenged on this matter, he revealed a bite wound to the arm, healed and now scarred, the infection having been overcome the previous year. The scouts in the situation followed their initial orders and executed the man in the street. To their credit, they were attempting to avert an uprising. They were not successful. The surviving scout was able to tell us of how the townspeople turned on them, consult the separate volume on managing disputes and dissipating conflict for ways this could have been avoided. Below is an account concerning a recently recorded encounter affected in part by the above information. Lieutenant James Buckner, Cartersville, Richmond, Virginia, September 30th, 1882. We were in the process of clearing out a small farmstead, and apprehension instilled in me the unshakable notion that we were not alone. My suspicions were confirmed during a thorough reconnaissance of the upper areas and rooftops. There was a figure crouched in the shadows by the open awning to the second level of the barn. He had likely been watching us for several minutes. The moment my scouting partner, a brawny fellow from Kentucky named Stokes, caught his eye, the hiding man pounced. It was like watching a tomcat pit its scrawny frame against a hunting mastiff. Yet, despite Stokes' bulk and strength, he was not in an advantageous position. The creature moved with swift feet and a rapacious fluidity of action. The struggle was equally swift, and by the time I had moved into a firing position and brought my rifle to bear, Stokes was down and bleeding from the head. The creature fixed me with fierce orange eyes and darted away behind the barn. Impulsively, rather than aiding poor Stokes, I set off on the hunt. My intention was to dispatch the creature in short order, return quickly, and set about tending to the wounded man. In a copse some hundred yards away from the farmstead, I spied the creature again, nursing a wound in its side where Stokes had planted a parting kiss with his saber. It crouched low, skin browned with accumulated dirt. That it had not a stitch of clothing barely occurred to me at the time. In fact, trousers and a coat would have seemed comically inappropriate for one such as this. It appeared to have been born in the forest. One of many wild animals vying for its place in the food chain. I surmised, nonetheless, that it had been a former occupant of this farm. Beneath the filthy, worn, and weathered carapace of earth was a lean, muscular frame, legs tensed to spring, powerful, clawed fingers braced against the leaves at our feet. It seemed neither to notice nor to comprehend the rifle I pointed in its direction. From the base of its chest came a hoarse bark, and then came the smile, that that frightful, leering, rictus grin that fixes their features before a pounce, and the promise of inhuman ferocity that would follow. Wasting no time, I steadied myself, and in a heartbeat I planted a bullet between its eyes. At the moment my shot fired, a heavy weight collided with my frame, and the creature's mate was on me. I had neither heard nor seen her, but clawed fingers dug into my flesh, and I felt those rightly enough. She snapped and bit at me, flinging aside my rifle. I remember punching at her, but the sharp pains and the blinding flashes mingled with her barking screams filled and overwhelmed my senses. Her teeth were at my collar, 
and I felt myself screaming too. And then there was an almighty tug, and I saw Stokes, framed against the late afternoon sun, yanking back the female's head by the hair and putting a bullet through it. Her body crumpled onto its side and lay still. I sank back in the leaves and prayed. These events happened not one hour ago. I now sit with Stokes, my wounds dressed and sheets of clean paper, pen and ink for me to leave my account. I understand, as do all of us, the importance of passing on this information so that others may learn from it. Stokes was lucky, having not taken in any of the creature's fluids during the altercations. Neither blood nor saliva had entered his body, though his skull had sustained a mighty blow he'd not soon forget. I was not so lucky. The female's bite marks at my throat, though not mortally wounding, are, we suspect, enough to pass on the infection. Maybe chance will favor me. The cleaning may have done its work. I'm perhaps one of the small number of those immune to this condition. However, I am feeling weakened and shaking, and in all likelihood I'm not long for this world. For my part, unlike so many who had died confused and alone, I feel blessed to have the opportunity to pass on my story and communicate these thoughts to those I love. As the sun sinks into the west and shadows lengthen, my thoughts are with my iris, safe at our home in Silver Spring, and with all God's will, still ready to bring our child into this world. I would that he were named Jonathan, after my father, a soldier whose bravery I now struggle to match. My head throbs with pressure. I feel nausea sweep over me. I must lie down. We sit by candlelight now. Stokes has had to ask me to behave. I do not see the need. I can feel myself slipping away. My vision swims. I have no cares anymore. I'm a man still. Stokes has not let me go. Goodbye, Iris. The following sentences are illegible scrawl, ending in a black pool where the inkwell was overturned. Process of Infection Lieutenant Buckner had fallen victim to the figurative venom of the Wendigo. Any blood, saliva, or other bodily fluids, as well as the flesh itself, carries with it this deadly affliction. Buckner was given a dignified hero's execution, and Stokes returned to his unit with the information imparted by the brave scout. The widow, Iris Buckner, did indeed bear a child. A daughter she named Joanna. When Joanna is old enough, she will read her father's last words and understand that his sacrifice was not in vain. He was posthumously awarded the Grave Duty Medal of Honor. Charcoal sketches found inside the house confirmed that the male was indeed the farmer, and the female was, in fact, its daughter. They had apparently inhabited the wooded area for some years. What Butner experienced was the loss of self, the loss of mind, and high intelligence that the onset of the infection brings. It is experienced in different ways, but it happens in a series of stages, usually over a period of four hours, depending on how much infected fluid has entered the body and from where. In the first ten to twenty minutes there will be dizziness, blurred vision. This may abate, depending on the severity of the wound, but even if it does, the victim of a bite must be separated from the group and watched. As the headaches, bodily pains, and nausea set in, they will begin to forget themselves, acting as though heavily intoxicated on wine or spirits. 
Sometimes this will bring euphoria and even an overwhelming sense of well-being. In others, it will precipitate violent bouts of anger. By the two-hour mark, the victim will become highly erratic, prone to fits of unseemly and often obscene behavior. The animal impulses are being exacerbated at this stage as their mind fades away. They are a danger to themselves and to those around them. It is thus at this stage that we encourage those watching over the affected to execute their bodies. There is nothing more that can be done for them. Left alive, they will nearly always attempt escape, appearing hostile and fearful of men. At this stage, they are wild and powerful and should not be grappled with for fear of passing on further infection. Some will drift into unconsciousness and not witness the remainder of their transformation. The ones left awake are in for a disturbing experience. We impart this to you now, not in hopes of instilling fear, but in understanding what occurs to them. They will scream, they will claw at themselves and tear at the clothes confining them. You will hear bones cracking and realigning. Their eyes will be bloodshot and take on an alarming orange hue. If they have not done so already, most will void their bowels and bladders. This is the beginning of a physical metamorphosis that takes weeks to fully complete. At the end of an average of four hours, however, they will be physically capable of swift, brutal movement, evasion and attack, and should at this stage be considered wild and lethal animals, far worse in fact than the wolf, cougar or bear. When a man is bitten by a wolf and survives, he does not become one in turn. That is the preserve of folklore, lycanthropy and the myth of the werewolf. However, this fairy tale bears so many relevant similarities with the condition we now face that it is worth examining for the basis in fact at its core. This was a story made up to explain how men could be gripped with an animalistic fury, lose the sight of themselves in which their humanity dwelled, and run wild, spreading this frenzy wherever they went. As our understanding of afflictions of the mind deepened over the centuries, so too did the superstition surrounding a man taking the form of a wolf slowly melt away into fable. It is thus once again rationality and appropriate action that will counteract the effects of this very real physical and mental condition that has swept through our world. While the carriers of this malady lose their humanity and all traces of the person they were prior to infection, they also gain certain benefits that make them excellent and formidable hunters. The following account details further the intimidating traits of the creatures we now face. Private Lawton Sadler, Madisonville, Tennessee, August 23, 1878 we came across a wendigo from a vantage point at the crest of a canyon. There were nearly a thousand yards between us, and thanks to the scout's swift action, we placed ourselves upwind. It had sighted a deer that had strayed from the woods and busied itself beside a stream with an evening drink. We noted at this stage that the wendigo had likewise positioned itself upwind of the deer and now crept towards it, using the brush for cover. It was naked and most likely male. It made no sound and moved patiently and deliberately, with a slinking, feline precision. Even from this distance we could observe it sniffing the air and cocking its head for any sign of other animals approaching. It was truly chilling to see what remained of a man, playing so skillfully at being a beast. It seemed to either not notice the rough terrain it was traversing, or else its feet and hands, legs and elbows were so leathery and conditioned that the skin now neither ruptured nor broke, as tough as the hide on a dog's paws. The deer paused for a moment and raised its head. The moonlight shone down on the ground around it, but the bushes nearby where our wendigo crouched were shrouded in shadow. The deer fixed them nonetheless with a long, trembling look. 
It began to move away from the water, and in doing so, deliberately edged away from the bushes. There was this low hiss, and the Wendigo sprang. The deer started and made to leap away to safety, but the Wendigo was already upon it, dashing the deer's head against a rock twice. The fallen animal lunged upwards in a desperate escape bid, but the Wendigo wrestled it down, breaking its hind leg at the knee and sinking its jaws into the deer's neck. There was a moment of thrashing, and the Wendigo was suddenly pushed off, rolling nimbly to one side. We could see its eyes shining in the darkness the light of the moon reflecting back. Around its maw was a messy splash of crimson. It fixed its gaze on the deer, which pulled itself to three of its hooves, and, mewling, attempted a hobbling gallop away toward the trees. Now, as a child, I owned a cat. He was an expert rat catcher, and would leave us offering after offering on the front stoop, for which we heaped praise and adulation upon him. But every so often I would find him at work in the night, watching with fascinated eyes as he mutilated and played with his prey, biting and clawing enough to injure but not kill, and then retreating to a safe distance to observe the rodent's last struggle for life. I later realized that the reason the cat was so successful and proficient a killer was that he never took on the strong rats in protracted single combat. Instead, he used his wits and cruelty to turn the fight to his own advantage. This is what I saw in the canyon last night creature of instinct and cunning following after its stumbling, crying, and bleeding prey calmly, carefully, and with full control over its urges. My companions and I surmised that this must be a well-fed Wendigo, not prone to the madness brought on by starvation of so many we encounter. After some time, the deer lay down and did not rise again. The Wendigo closed in, and though the deer kicked at it feebly, the wind's teeth clamped around the beast's jugular. Shortly thereafter, the feeding began. Now, I've hunted and cleaned deer myself, and I'm no stranger to their components, but the methodical manner this former man adopted as he gorged upon its flesh gave him the appearance of one bathing in viscera. The heavy scent of it on the breeze made all three of us wretch. The scout, Askook, was the one who attempted the kill. Quietly, casting aside his rifle for fear of attracting more nearby Wendigo attention with the echoing crack of gunpowder. Instead, he unslung his bow and crept to a vantage point. With the wind against him, it had to be far closer or his arrow's course would be diverted. He motioned for us to stay back. Private Collins and I trained our Winchesters on the far-off figure of the Wendigo. Askook deftly notched an arrow and drew back the string. As it produced only the faintest of creaks, I, I couldn't hear the sound, but the Wendigo must have done. Its head snapped around, and it fixed Askook with a blazing scowl and that rictus grin. Askook loosed the arrow, but it thudded uselessly into the deer carcass, for the Wendigo was already crossing the distance between them, which now seemed altogether too short. Collins fired a mist. My shot grazed past and impacted on the rocks between them. At this juncture, I, I cannot overemphasize the debilitating fear that comes with shooting at something that moves this fast and with consequences this dire if they reach you or your companions. Anybody who's faced down a mountain line will understand the, the unutterable tension of that moment you have to commit to squeezing the trigger. As Cook had freed his knife and brought it down on the creature's left shoulder, eliciting this barking scream of rage from the Wendigo. The two struggled as Collins and I raced over, ready in our rifles once again. The scout pulled himself out from under the Wendigo and bolted towards the stream, his body slick with fresh blood. The Wendigo was bleeding profusely from neck, shoulder, and deep lacerations to its heart, and still in the grip of spasm, it rolled over and hissed at the two of us, its mouth pulling back once again into that parody of a smile. We shot it until it stopped moving. Askook eventually emerged from the stream. He checked and cleaned his wounds over and over, cursing in the language of the Cree. We sat with him a while, waiting for the telltale signs of the onset of infection. This was a man we had fought beside for many months. We knew his childhood aspirations and the names of his three children. It was, in fact, the moment he forgot them that he began to climb the highest cliff of the canyon. 
This was how he wanted to end it, and we... We abided by his wishes. It was one simple thought to hold on to, the control of his own ultimate demise. I don't know if savages end up in limbo for such sins, but it would be a cruel father who would forever imprison a man so brave. We buried him far from the grave pit of the Wendigo. Food of the Wendigo it is a common misconception that the Wendigo will feed exclusively on humans. This is not at all the case. What appears to be true, however, is that humans are, to date, the only animals that can suffer the infection and succumb to the physical and mental state of the Wendigo. They will eat any meat available to them. Cattle, deer, sheep, birds, carrion though they will avoid truly rotten flesh. It is also not true that they will not feed off one another. In fact, many concentrated areas of Wendigo populations will do precisely this. But this is patently a last resort. Some survival quirk of the species to prevent it from self-destruction. When they eat, they will first gorge on the blood though often much of this is drained from their victims in the kill before the feeding begins. The high iron content of the blood may fulfill some deficiency of that mineral. After the initial frenzy, they eat in a methodical and careful manner. They will devour the body, starting with the flesh, proceeding to the muscle, and then the organs. The bowels and intestines they will usually leave, a grown man will sustain a wendigo for several days. It is not uncommon for them to drag the carcass back to the nest to keep it safe for themselves. Occasionally they will share a meal with other wendigos, but there is violent competition for food, often leading to instances of starvation. During the Civil War there were many prison camps set up. This was the worst of places to find yourself. Food was scarce. Disease rife, and the exposure to the elements a constant threat. The camps claimed one in ten of the men who died during the conflict, but in scenarios so far from anything that could resemble glory, that the despair experienced in these dark, desolate places would have been incomparable. When the war ceased and the men were set free, often after years of incarceration it was not uncommon for them to be near skeletal in appearance. When the war ceased and the men were set free, often after years of incarceration, it was not uncommon for them to be near skeletal in appearance, malnourished, neglected and ill-treated, to a wraith-like existence. Having witnessed this myself firsthand, I can attest the sight and notion of what a man can be reduced to as haunted my nightmares in the years since. However, having seen Wendigos in the advanced stages of starvation, seen them devoid of their former cunning, stumbling on stick-thin legs towards their prey, and finding untold reserves of frenzied strength within their brittle frame, and biting into them with yet more ferocity than their well-fed relations, I can assure you that nightmare was replaced. Part 2 Equipment Standard Issue We Unified States Soldier Forget all mythology relating to immortal creatures. This is an animal, plain and simple. They breathe, sleep, eat, and drink in a similar fashion to us. We have established they are fast, resilient, and cunning. But that will not outmatch a well-placed bullet. This next section details all the weapons and tools you will have access to. Rifle Since the speed of the creatures makes reaction essential, all standard-issue firearms in the RS military make smooth and swift reloading a priority. The 1873 Winchester, now carried by most riflemen, is capable of dispatching a Wendigo in a single, well-placed round, 
and then chambering another bullet within seconds. Muzzle loaders like the Springfield 1861 musket utilized throughout the Civil War are no longer to be employed. The mini ball, while devastating to the body if a sufficiently accurate shot is made, simply takes too long to reload. The extended shot preparation time could cost the regiment their lives. If such a circumstance were to occur, the amount of shots, and thus the amount of wendigos, that a group carrying the Springfield could dispatch, relative to one carrying the Winchester, would be exponentially reduced. It is most recommended that you aim for the head, or the heart, for the swiftest kill possible. Wounded, they are still deadly, and while some will attempt to flee or hide, the starving Wendigo may continue to attack in a blood frenzy. Many a soldier has been caught off guard, focusing on the running creatures twenty yards away, while one that has crawled to his position latches onto his leg. Revolver For mid- to close-range combat, the Colt Army Model 1860 is still the standard issue, more than twenty years later. Over 220,000 of these have been manufactured over the past two decades. Unlike the Springfield, they have not been so outmoded as to negate their exceptional usefulness for our purposes. Availability of Ammunition Familiarity with weight and fire in action, reliability and ease of maintenance. All these things count in this weapon's favor. It is for use within distances of between two and fifteen yards. Any further away and you will be unlikely to attain an accurate shot. Any closer and the resultant expulsion of fluids and bone will be a danger to all around you. Melee Weapon During the years leading up to the Battle of Washington, the close quarters weapon frequently employed was the Bowie Knife. While these are still carried for various other purposes, as a means of dispatching the Wendigo, the knife has in subsequent years been replaced by an altogether different implement of war. Captain Samuel Tudor, District of Columbia, March 17th, 1882. The first things I realized we must do away with that was so often present during close-range execution of the creatures was the abundance of blood and other fluids often in flight and uncontrolled. My time amid the streets during the Battle of Washington had taught me many things about how they act, especially when relegated to a more personal distance. The knife, I surmised, was a splendid way to dispatch a fellow human, or to butcher an animal in preparation for its journey to our dinner tables, but it was altogether an instrument of self-imposed danger, for not only the wielder, but every man standing within six feet of him. Arterial spray emerges with far more force than one might imagine, especially, it seems, from the jugulars of creatures whose wild hearts must be pumping nineteen to the dozen. A well-placed blade at this juncture can, and indeed has, showered many soldiers in the vicinity with a poison more potent and lethal than arsenic. Back in Cincinnati I had been a blacksmith, and none too shabby of a tradesman, I might add. As the dust settled on our newly retaken capital, I set to work designing a weapon to be used in substitution for the standard-issue bowie knife we had favored those past few years, one crafted specifically with this venomous species in mind. Blunt force was what I concluded as the key to their dispatching by the safest means possible. The weapon needed to be relatively light, inexpensive, durable, able to be used with one or two hands, and indeed versatile enough to offer more deadly force when applied with full focus. An axe would be useful, but the possibility of severed limbs and deep cuts with again a resultant mess of fluids was still present. The answer was that medieval favorite, the mace. Thirty inches long and weighing some 2.2 .2 pounds, mine was constructed of steel and cherry wood. 
We needed no flanges or spikes, as our enemy wears no armor. Instead, broad pegs of steel extended from its multi-paneled head. A pommel at the base also sported a similar peg, to be employed swiftly if space was further limited. Due to its weight and the time it takes to swing, even two-handed, I surmised that we must first take away from the creatures that nimble animal evasiveness that plays so frequently in their favor, and would severely reduce our chances of a killing blow with the first strike. So it would be the knee first, then a decisive and lethal follow-up to the cranium or the temple. Take away the leg, then take away the head. I practiced four hours a day with it, as I rose and before I slept, and acting with utmost conviction each time the felon of a creature. My arms grew familiar with the weight and heft. My body learned the motions of the various positioning scenarios I trained myself for, until I could do this with neither a moment's preparation nor a second thought. By the time I went out on patrol by the area near the Patuxent River, I had secured with my commanding officer the privilege to bring along my new companion, which I had named Clementine after my darling wife. On that day, in September 1880, Clementine beat the lives out of six Wendigos. The men around me joked that they would pay handsomely for me to construct them similar companions. I took each of these offers with the most serious of consideration. Ten days later, my lieutenant came to me with a summons from General Curtis himself. It seemed Clementine had become quite the talk of the town. By December, I had overseen the manufacture of one thousand of these military field maces, with three thousand more to come in the next twelve months. They have now become standard issue in the R.S. military, and the mechanical and precise movements I taught myself are now part of a variety of regimented weapon drills. I was pleased to note that many white scarves took it upon themselves to customize their maces with differing grips, hand guards, knuckle dusters, and even in the case of one enterprising gunsmith, a single bullet shot concealed in the pommel. Many also gave a name to their companion, though Clementine became popular in a way that I know she would have, with blush and grace, approved. Standard Issue Equipment, Reunified States Scout As well as the Colt 1860, cartographer scouts may also carry the following. Bow The best possible way to dispatch a lone Wendigo who has not yet detected you would be how Askook the scout was intending. A perfectly aimed and silent arrow to the eye. This will circumvent the noisy report of gunfire and be less liable as a result to attract further Wendigo attention. Their keen senses can, of course, be used to your advantage if you wish to draw some out of hiding. A loud noise or strong odor will often prove an adequate lure, though be of utmost caution regarding being flanked. Every scout has the option of a longbow or hunting bow in place of their Winchester rifle for precisely this purpose. It is of paramount importance that scouts are not laden down with too many weapons or heavy kit, since they are going to have to move the fastest, often in the most dangerous and mismatched of situations. Rifle Alternatively, an 1873 Winchester with the addition of a telescopic sight can be employed for scouts who wish to specialize as snipers Sword. Scouts and cavalry soldiers, you will find the model 1879 light artillery sabre will allow you to defend yourself on horseback and on foot. It has been manufactured expressly for the purposes of dispatching the Wendigo at speed. Inspired and designed by the katanas of Japan, the steel is folded many more times than standard military blades to increase durability when cleaving through bone. Horse. If you are a scout or cavalry soldier, 
your horse stays with you. It is a serviceman's duty to keep that horse well fed, watered, healthy and alert. They will spook easily in the presence of wendigos and their cries will draw alert to you, so careful management must be employed when surveying a new area. Out in the wilderness, this animal is often the difference between a ride back to your unit and a deadly trek across wendigo-infested countryside, to say nothing of attacks from other wild animals. It is, in almost every case, better to rely on the horse than to eschew the speed and protection they provide in favor of total self-reliance. Be sure that you are not dragged from your mount. Your saber is there for this precise reason. A slice to the temple, even if this does not dispatch your attacker immediately, should unsteady them from their footing, allowing for escape. Survival Kit The following account will provide more details of the contents and purpose. Dr. Julius Kaufman, Baltimore, Maryland, January 15th, 1882 as a scout, you must come to see your survival kit for exactly what it represents. A pouch of implements standing between you and the Grim Reaper. Used properly, these will keep him at bay. Improperly or not at all, and your chances of coming to a sticky end are significantly increased. Most of these tools have more than one use. Some have several. The first implement is your sewing kit. It comprises of needles of four sizes and threads for closing and binding wounds as well as maintaining your clothing. The larger one can be used for fixing leather and comes with thick cord. It can also be used upon your horse should the animal find itself cut and willing to undergo impromptu veterinary attentions. One small bottle of vetal alcohol. This must be replenished every chance you get. Wounds must be cleaned with it. If no other field medicine is available, it can be used as a mild anesthetic if mixed one part alcohol to one part water and ingested in small doses. It can be used in a desperate measure to start a signal fire, so this will draw the vendigo also. You have a small box containing flint and tinder for lighting your campfires every evening. Weapon Maintenance Kit Whatever load of firearms, blades, and other instruments of war you are carrying, it is up to you to ensure they remain at their peak of usability. A sword encrusted with blood will rust swiftly, and this will consume your blade, making it brittle and causing it to stick in the scabbard and break upon bone. Even the oils from your fingers will taint the blade. It must be cleaned with a soft cloth before sheathing, and you must regularly oil and sharpen the keen edge. If you do not have access to a boy knife, a small field blade can be issued for purposes of cleaning any game you may hunt. This, like the sword, must be maintained. Your rifle and sidearm will likewise require stripping down, cleaning, and polishing. Retrieved arrows must be repaired and maintained also. Every one of these represents a potential quiet kill. The best policy of the stealthy scout, save for careful outmaneuvering of our enemy. Your water canteen. This will hold two quarts, and you must drink it all every day. Then find a fresh, clean water source from which to refill it. Double that in climates with extremes of hot and cold, or when you are strenuously exerted. Without this water, you will live for up to three days. But after that, you are done. Under strenuous exertion, that period could drop to mere hours. Ration it if you have no other option. But be aware that replenishing of this precious, life-giving element should be at the very peak of your priority list. Compass, paper, and pencils. As a map maker, it is clearly your prerogative to spend a portion of your day charting the landscape. You will have been trained to find north and how to negotiate the terrain in the most successful manner to return you to safety. Any and all information on settlements is also to be made note of in your journal. These are to be returned to your base camp and coordinated by the director of your party. 
The assembled information is then conveyed to every key point back to Washington, thereby updating all records and ensuring the topographical military information is shared across this network. Scarf While this is technically part of your uniform, it has such a practical application for survival that I must discuss it here. The blood that a Vendigo will emit when wounded or killed can be quite volatile and lively, scattering all over the periphery. During the Battle of Washington, the enlisted men took the tying scarves around the lower halves of their faces, covering their mouths. The white cotton showed swiftly who had been sprayed. Often, once the immediate threat was dealt with, the scarves were removed where the men stood, and the clean areas used to wipe away any excess bloods that had adorned their skin. They would then be dropped in the street, and fresh scarves would be sent forward. Now the soldiers habitually wear these round their necks in readiness, hence the popular label of white scarves for many veterans of this conflict. On a personal note, I find it amusing that the former motif of ceasefire, request for negotiations, or even surrender, is now being used to reinvigorate the troops and prepare them for subsequent battle. We have no further use of this symbol, not with the enemies we face. Look after this kit and your equipment with the dedication and cultivation of a father or mother to their child. Every life that spider webs away from you and your influence depends on this. Uniform We Unified States Soldier With so many of these now lying unused in houses, having been manufactured two decades past for clothing the Federal Army, it was deemed uneconomical to invest precious time, materials, and manpower into constructing something similarly fit for purpose as the Union Army Ensemble. It constitutes a knee-length tight-fitting Prussian blue coat, cavalry wear a shorter version more practically suited for riding, with the addition of shoulder straps denoting rank for officers. This is accompanied by sky blue pants, stripes again denoting officers' rank, and a black felt hardy hat or blue KP cap to keep off the sun. Variation was commonplace during the Civil War, and it must be understood that this is symptomatic of our ability to adapt and should be positively encouraged. However, everything must have a purpose and an explanation. Wear what parts of the uniform are practical at a given time. Do not burden yourself with thick wool in the burning sun. Every alteration must have premeditated thought behind it. Be prepared to explain yourself in a serious manner to your officers. A discarded coat in the depths of winter to greet the chill of frost for an overheating man could well precipitate a bout of pneumonia that could wipe out the unit. We Unified States Scout Unlike the infantry or cavalry, the scouts have another remit, going beyond representing the regimental colors of the RSA. You must blend into your surroundings and stay undetected by the Wendigo. To this end, the color scheme for the scouts is a mixture of sandy brown, dark green, and tan, with leather coats adaptable for cold or hot climes. Your spurs are muffled, your buttons black Goodyear rubber to avoid sunlight reflection. A wide-brimmed brown felt Stetson hat will protect your head from the sun. Your boots are some of your most important tools, crafted for both riding and negotiating rough terrain. They are hard-wearing enough to keep out the rain, but light enough to run in. Protect your feet. A lame scout is the next male for the Wendigo.